You know, there is a lot of power in last words. Uh, if you ever read things about the, the, what people said uh, in the last minutes, seconds of their life, I think it says a lot about them. Uh, and they have so much power, as a matter of fact, that if you make a deathbed confession uh, that you committed a crime, that could be admitted in a court of law. And so the, it has a lot of power. And, and, and so I, I decided one time to look up what did some people uh, that were or still are well known, uh, what did they, what were their last words? So some of you will remember, if you're my age, Bing Crosby, and he was an actor and a singer, loved golf, loved golf. And they had, he and uh, three other friends went golfing, and he, at the end of it, he said, that's a great game, that was a great game of golf, fellas and died. George Apple, you probably haven't heard of George Apple. Uh, he was uh, executed by electric chair in 1928, and his last words were this, uh, well, gentlemen, you are about to see a baked apple. Kind of, uh, kind of strange, but that's what he said. Humphrey Bogart, again, a very well-known actor in his day. He, his, these were his last words. I should never have switched from scotch to martinis. <laughs> Some of them are a bit more positive. Uh, Al, Aben, Elben W. Barkley, who was a former vice president of the United States, his last words were this. I'd rather, oh, thank you. I'd rather be a servant in the house of the Lord than to sit in the seats of the Almighty. Of the mighty, sorry. Mother Teresa, her last words, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. And then Michael Faraday, who was a 19th century scientist, said, I shall be with Christ, and that is enough. So last words are really, really uh, important. And, and so in our text this morning, Joshua is nearing the end of his life. His time on earth is coming to an end. He's been leading the people of Israel for some time now. And, and, and he has some last words, which I think anybody who is a leader would love to have. It's the chance to kind of say a last word to his family or, or to his to his uh, staff or whatever, his elders or whatever it would be, that you would long to have that time. Uh, I, I often think that if I knew I was going to die, if it wasn't a sudden thing, I would actually do videos to my children, my grandchildren, my wife, my great-grandson. I only have one now, but I'm hoping for more. And, and I would just say some things that I would want to say to them. And then I would do to be played at my funeral, because almost nobody in my family are Christians, I would do a plan of salvation to let them know how they could become Christians, although I've done it lots of times before. But, but and, and so we, we think of these things. What If I had a, a, a week left to live, what would I want to say? Who would I want to say it uh, to? And so he gathers the people together. And, and he says some things to them that I think are incredibly, incredibly pertinent to us today that we need to hear. And so he gathers the people together, uh, uh, the leaders, all the rest of the people together, and he shares his last words with them. And in verse 1, it says that they presented themselves before him, before God. And so he tells them what he wants to tell them, sort of a, a final message. And then they present themselves before the Lord. And so the first 10 verses of this chapter are more or less a history lesson. Here's what happened to us. Here's, you know, all these things going through. Here's where, what we were, what we are. And, and, and it reminds him, that he reminds them of what their life has been since they crossed the Jordan. He tells, reminds them of all that's happened. And, and so, if you read 
those 10 verses, I think what you're going to find is that Joshua is as concerned about the people now as he was when he first took over from Moses. He has the same concerns, the same concerns that any godly leader has for his people. And, and he just wants to share them with them again. And, and again, throughout his ministry, throughout his ministry life, we see that Joshua didn't focus on himself. Joshua focused on God and focused on the people. And that's what he does in these final verses also. Now, this is actually the, the last chapter, and it is actually the fourth, not the first, but the fourth call to covenant renewal that Joshua has called the people to. Four times in, the, in this book, he calls the people to review, renew their relationship with God. And I think that, that says something to us. It says that, that we need to regularly be reminded, whether it's in our own hearts or somebody reminding us or God speaking to us, we need to be reminded that we've never made it as Christians. And, and we need to consistently be looking at ourselves and say, what, what, what needs to be renewed in my life? God, speak to my heart about where I need renewal in my life. And so this is the fourth time that this is happening. And, and he longs for the people to be faithful to God more than anything else. And so he says these very well-known verses in, in verses 14 and 15. And he says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I cannot choose for you who you should serve. He even gives them the options. <laughs> Here's some other options. But, it doesn't matter to me who you serve. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If there's anything that Joshua has learned as a leader, particularly leading a people as stubborn as the Israelites, he has learned that the human heart can be hard sometimes. And it's not easy for us. It seems to be kind of a, an ingrained stubbornness within us that doesn't want to surrender our wills to the Lord. There seems to be something within us that allows ourselves to become complacent in our walk with the Lord and serving others. There seems to be something within us that is prone to compromise. And let me say this to you, compromise never begins with anything big. It begins with something small. Just a little tiny compromise that won't impact anybody. But as time goes on, it begins to impact you and maybe your family, and maybe others. There seems to be something in us that wants to avoid commitment. And so today what I want us to do is to look at some key final words that Joshua is trying to leave with the Jewish nation to say to them, Keep walking with God. Keep on keeping on with God. And one of the things you're going to notice as we go through these, none of them will be a surprise to you. None of them were a surprise to the Israelites. They were all things that they had heard before. Although this is relatively early in the history of Israel, they're things that they had heard 
from their forefathers. And so what Joshua is doing is reminding them. And again, how often we need those reminders. How often we need to remember things that we've already heard. In 1 Peter, Peter's writing to the people and he says, I am writing to remind you. I am writing to remind you. And that's what I'm doing today. I'm going to use Joshua's words to remind you of what it means to walk with God in this journey of faith that all of us are on. And the first thing he says is that first part of verse 14, where he says, uh, fear God with sincerity and faithfulness. And, And the first thing that he reminds them, and I want to remind you, is to fear the Lord wholeheartedly. Fear the Lord with everything that you've got inside you. And it begins with this. He says, the first word he says in chapter, in verse 1, is now. Now. What he's saying is, uh, oh, sorry, in verse 14, he gives him this history lesson. And he's told them for 10 verses where they were. Remember this. Remember when God did this. Remember when God did that. Remember when this happened. And then he says, now. Based on all of these things, based on all the things that God has done to, for us, in all the ways that God has blessed us, in all the way that God has revealed himself to us, he says, stand in awe of him. Revere him. Worship him. Treat him with respect and, 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 and obedience. Why? One reason. Because he's God. Because he's God. We are children of the Most High God. And that alone means that we want to fear him wholeheartedly. He's worthy of our respect and our praise and our worship. And when we have this this reverential fear of God that fills every inch of our hearts and our lives. We're going to be faithful. We're going to be faithful to him and all that he wants for us. When we deal with him, we want to be faithful. When we, when we deal with others and serve others, we want to be faithful in the ministries that he's called us to. Proverbs 15, says, Fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom. We learn wisdom through our fear of him. Proverbs 19, 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. Do you want to rest satisfied? Then build, work on building our fear of the Lord wholeheartedly. We will not be Visited by harm, Proverbs 19 says, when our fear is in the Lord. And it's not just in the Old Testament. In in Hebrews 12, 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. He cleanses us. He purifies us. If we will allow him to. Sometimes I think that that we want that more than anything. We want to be purified. We want to be cleansed. And then the flashlight of God's Holy Spirit shines into an area of our heart, an area of our lives. And we say, everywhere but there, God. Everywhere but there. I cannot, I will not surrender that to you. A.W. Tozer, a late pastor and author, said this, 
What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And so he says, people, I'm going to die soon. So I want to say to you, fear the Lord wholeheartedly. Then he goes on in the second part of verse 14, and, and, and he says to serve him, to serve God. And he's calling the people to serve God with all that they have. And, and, and this word serve, uh, the, original, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, it, it, that word serve in the Hebrew comes from the same root as worship. And so to worship is to serve. And to serve is to worship. And that's what we are called to do. Three times, three times in this chapter, in verses 18 and 21 and 24, he speaks to the people and they respond this way. We will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. This chapter, and, and indeed the whole Bible, tells us that the highest honor that can be given to us is to be a servant of the Lord. Somebody said this, it's easy to want to be a servant. But what happens when somebody treats us like a servant? then it's not quite so fun anymore. But we're called to be servants. I remember when I was teaching at the college and, and I, I taught preaching. You know what they say, those who do, do, and those who can't teach. And, uh, and so I taught preaching and this one young gal was doing her message uh, in chapel and, and you know the students in the class and I would grade it. And she was preaching on servanthood. And she said, it, it always amazes me when Pastor Dan, who's the president of the college, will help bring food out from the cafeteria. And my head kind of went very unservant-like, you know. But then this thought, thought hit me. Why should that seem strange to her? Why should it seem strange to this young gal, 18, 19 years old, that a leader is also a servant? And beloved, it's because a lot of our servants today, a lot of our leaders today, are not servants. Sorry to tell you that. A lot of our leaders today, our pastoral leaders, are not servants. I had to learn that lesson well into my Ministry life. We're called to be servants. All of us. Not just you, but each elder and Pastor Joel and Kim. We're all called to be servants. It's so easy today to seek positions of leadership because we like the authority, we like the power. We want to be in the spotlight ministries. We want to be up front, in front of everybody. But we've lost this New Testament concept, like I said, of leaders being servants. Simply serving out of love for Jesus. Jesus loves me and he saved me. When the, he, there was no reason for him to do that. I had done nothing to earn it or deserve it. And Jesus saved me. And out of my response to that, I want to minister to people. I want to help people. And, and, and that's what Joshua is saying to them. Just serve the Lord faithfully. 
And it's not always easy. I doubt that the people who usually teach or, or run the AV this morning, but I, I, I doubt any of them ever get up on a Sunday morning at I don't know what time and says, oh, I love to do this. Not every day they don't, but they do it anyway. You know, one of the things in life that scares me the most, speaking in front of people. Like right now, my mouth is so dry. My hands sweat before I'm getting up. But God called me to do it. So every Sunday when I'm sitting there and I'm saying, I don't want to do this. I do it because I want to serve God faithfully. So he says, this is, these are my last words, fear the Lord wholeheartedly, serve the Lord faithfully. And then he says, in, in the last part of verse 14, he says, worship the Lord exclusively. Don't worship anyone or anything else. Worship the Lord. It's amazing to me, the people of Israel, and then I look at my own life, and I say I'm just the same. But how many times the people of Israel tripped up because they wouldn't throw away their idols? We're serving God. We're worshiping God exclusively. Uh, we just got a few of, of these uh, idols around, just in case. And, and, and he says, put away your idols in verse 14. And it literally means to throw them so far away that their power over them, is, over us, is gone. The problem for many of us is that we don't put them away. We keep them very close by so we can reach them. And we see later in this chapter, in verse 23, I think it is, that the people had their idols close by. He says, put away the foreign gods that are among you. So right there as he's challenging them, these idols are still there. It's as if they wanted this spiritual security blanket that if God doesn't work out, I've got this other option. If I discover that serving God is uncomfortable, difficult, then I've got this other idol here that I can worship. And of course, an idol is not just a, a statue or something. It, it's anything that we love or fear more than God. And it may involve the worship of a person. Uh, an image, an object, uh, an idea, anything. These are all things that we can worship that st steal away from our worship of God. The thing we have to understand is that an idol is often not evil in and of itself. In and of itself, the idol is not evil. For example, I know people, particularly one friend I have, who is addicted to sports. It's the only thing I can say. And I, he's, he's a Christian, but I know that it steals away from his time with God sometimes. So it isn't always, like I say, a statue. It can be different kinds of things. John Piper, Pastor John Piper, said this, Idols are your basic things, gardening and reading and decorating, and traveling, and investing, and TV watching, and internet service, surfing, and shopping, and exercising, and collecting. All of them can be deadly substitutes for God. See, just a simple thing like shopping. I've counseled shopaholics. And that's the only thing I can say. They just can't stop buying. They'll go tens of thousands of dollars into debt. Sign up for credit cards that their spouse doesn't know about. That's become an idol. I love what 
John Calvin said, the, one of the late reformers, 1600s, 1500s, and he said this, the human heart is an idol factory. The human heart is an idol factory. Now, maybe you would disagree. I can't. Because, see, I know the things that are in my heart sometimes. And I wish I could say, you're wrong, Calvin. My heart is not an idol factory. And so Joshua is urging the people to consider their options and to make their choice. And then he tells them to do some things that really apply to us today. He says, you could go back and worship the gods your forefathers had. And those gods, those gods focused on spiritual highs and, and mysticism and astrology and, and, and all kinds of things that we see in our world around us today. Or they could go back and worship the gods of Egypt. And those were gods of materialism and, and, and they were attractive because Egypt was, was represented power and prestige. And, and as bad as a country, even though the Jews had been there for 400 years as slaves, there was still something about the culture that was so impressive. Or, he said, if you don't want to worship those... He says, that then worship the gods of the Amorites, where they were living right then. And these were, were, were offered kind of physical, sexual pleasures. That was the gods that were there. The emphasis there was on outward success, being successful. And beloved, those are the same gods that we worship today. The god of spiritual highs, the god of experience. The God of physical and sexual pleasures. He knew that if they didn't get rid of those idols, then eventually they would forsake the Lord. Hebrews 3.12 says, Take care, brothers, lest there be any of lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. And here's another amazing fact. The very last verse of 1 John 5.21 says this. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. It's the last thing that John says in his first letter. Keep yourselves from idols. If he, if he were using a Joshua's Language, he might say, put them away and keep them away. And so if we want to continue to walk with God on this faith of journey, we fear the Lord wholeheartedly, Joshua says. We serve him faithfully. We worship him exclusively. And then this is the big one, I think. He says, choose the Lord willingly. Choose the Lord willingly. A friend of mine in Edmonton, not a believer, but he needed to rent some office space for his shop. So he went to talk to the landlord. The landlord was a believer. So he said, if you'll pray with me right now to receive Christ, I'll take 15% off the rent. So guess what my buddy did? He prayed to receive Christ. He's a businessman. Save 15%. Now, he never walked with Christ. He just prayed the prayer. But it wasn't done willingly. But notice the urgency with which Joshua speaks here in chapter 15. Choose for yourselves this day. Choose for yourselves this day who you are going to serve. The Lord is Yahweh. 
He's, he's highly relational. He, he's involved with them. He's shown his love for them over and over and again. He's fought for them. He's revealed himself. He continues to, continually offers love to them. And Joshua declares his devotion for the Lord. Doesn't matter to me what you do. I can't control what you choose. But as for me and my house. He declares his devotion to God. He surrenders his will to God. And because of that, he and his family had decided that we will serve the Lord. I, I don't know what it was like to follow Christ in the old days. But I think today it's really, really, really hard. And we face this political wokeness that tries to control our beliefs, tries to control our actions, wants to tell us what to believe. And it is so, so hard. I could be like Linda and ask, how many of you here want to be liked? And we would all put our hands up. I don't want to be disliked. But I'm not willing to do the things that would make me liked in some circles today. Beloved, hear me say this clearly. We cannot live with one foot here and one foot here. One foot in the world, one foot following Jesus. You can't do it. You can't do it. Author G.K. Chesterton said, The Christian life has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. I don't ever want to be anything but a believer. I spent 28 years doing that. Don't want to do it again. But I'm telling you that it's hard sometimes. We all know that. If you want to be a believer that says, I love Jesus. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves you. He wants you to come to Christ. It's the only way to get to heaven. Only way to know God. Then you're not going to be popular. But when we try to live with a foot in each world, it leads to confusion. It leads to doubt. It leads to skepticism. A hundred years later, or hundreds of years later, Elijah asks the same question in 1 Kings 18, 21. Do you remember the story? He's on the mountain. He's fighting the prophets of Baal. The people of Israel are kind of standing around watching. And finally, before he calls the fire down from heaven, he turns to them and he says, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? I love that. How long will you go limping between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. The people did not answer him a word. There's something within us that, 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 again, reacts against making a commitment. We'd rather not choose a side. Maybe it's, again, because we want to keep our options open. I am convinced of something. I, I share my faith quite a bit with people. And I'm convinced the number one thing that presents, prevents people from giving their life to Christ is that they don't want to surrender. They want all the benefits that the Lord gives us without any of the responsibilities. I'm convinced of that. Number one reason, people don't want to surrender. Most people know that if I choose to serve God, it means I have to surrender to them, to him, and I don't want to do that. So Joshua, Joshua decided to serve God. And he said, I have chosen, I am choosing, and I will forever choose. I myself 
and my family will serve the Lord. So let me just close with this. Some of you know the name Dwight L. Moody. He was an evangelist in the late uh, 1900s and early 2000s, 1800s and 1900s. And he heard a preacher say this one time. The world has yet to see what God can do with a life totally surrendered to him. And Moody said this, I will be that man. I will be the man who lives a life totally surrendered to God. And I want to remind us this morning that God is still looking for men like that. And he's looking for women like that. And he's looking for youth like that. And he's looking for children like that. He's still looking for those people today. And so as we close, I ask you this morning, will you be that man who says, I will live my life totally surrendered to God? Will you be that woman who says, I will live my life totally surrendered to God? If you're a youth, would you commit yourself to be a youth who lives a life totally surrendered to God? And especially if you're a youth, this is hard stuff. I know that. See, for me, I chose the opposite. I chose, because I wanted to be accepted, I chose alcohol and drugs. But I'm telling you, it can be done. Youth, teens. And he's looking for children who will say, I will be a child who is totally committed and surrendered to Christ. Thank you, Father God. Thank you so much for this call that you have in our lives. That you would enable us, Lord, to live for you, surrender to you, to serve you, to worship you. All of these things, Father God. May each of us leave here today with a commitment that I will be that person who surrenders themselves totally to God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.